so much for joining us. Our first presentation today is a very interesting presentation. It's called Changing the Way the World Gets Divorced. So divorce is one of the most stressful events that one can experience, yet a full 50% of marriages end in just this way. In this presentation, Holly Haggerty will interview family law attorney Joran Jenkins, mental health practitioner Wendy Coughlin, and certified divorce financial analyst Rebecca Murphy, who will answer questions and discuss collaborative law and other courtless divorce options. These options are not only less expensive than traditional trial divorce processes, they are also much less stressful. In some cases, even in the process, sorry, even the process even results in the couple results in the couple being on better terms in their new relationship than while married. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce Holly Haggerty. Hi, Wendy. Thank you so much. So I have had the pleasure of working with collaborative professionals, including these three professionals today over the past few years and have developed quite a passion for it because I see what a difference it makes. So we're very fortunate that they can all join us. So the first person I would I'd actually like to bring them all up so you can go ahead and turn on your videos and I'll start the introductions. So over the past 40 years of practicing law, Joran Jenkins has had a wide variety of experience. She was a professor of law at Stetson University and is the only practicing lawyer in Florida to be awarded the prestigious A. Sherman Christensen Award. Only one of those is awarded a year by the United States Supreme Court. She has been a prosecuting trial attorney, a bankruptcy attorney, a traditional family law attorney, and for the recent, most recent 10 years, she's been a champion of the collaborative law practice. Joran has even published seven books on collaborative practice, including I Never Saw My Father Again and The Divorce Court Effect, War and Peace Aboard the Destruction of Divorce Court. So she's seen a lot of the good, the bad, and the ugly, and we're really pleased to have her here today. The next person I'd like to introduce is Rebecca Murphy. She's a certified divorce financial analyst. In 2007, she created Facilitated Divorce Solutions to empower individuals with sensible alternatives to litigation. She helps her clients move their lives forward as financially independent persons. She is also an attorney. Becky also led the Cleveland Academy of Collaborative Professionals as president for two years to help increase public awareness of this new unique approach to decoupling. Becky not only has professional experience with collaborative divorce, she has a very unique personal experience on her own restructured family, which she'll share with us later. She's considered Cleveland's number one nester, which you'll find out about. The next person I would like to introduce is Dr. Wendy Coughlin, and I wanna make sure I'm saying that right, correct, Wendy? Coughlin works, yes. Wonderful. So Dr. Wendy Coughlin has practiced as a mental health professional for 35 years, and she has expertise in multiple areas. Substance use disorders invaded her childhood and, in, and adult life, so those were natural areas for specialization. She's the parent of two gifted children, which led her to become involved with the Gifted Association of Pinellas. After observing families being nearly destroyed by court intervention, Wendy became certified as a guardian ad litem, qualified as a parenting coordinator. She's a certified family mediator and a collaborative facilitator. She is a leading fellow in the Florida Academy of Collaborative Professionals. As a collaborative facilitator, she leads collaborative teams to help families transition from coupleship to co-parenting from separate households. So with that, we're gonna go ahead and get started with the interview. And I think what I'd like to do is just for people who don't know what the collaborative process is, I'd like to have you explain that. So why don't we go ahead and start with that? Okay. Joran, maybe, maybe you could start Joran and then Wendy, I'd like you to transition in because Joran, uh, I think you mentioned something earlier that makes it very key as far as how the attorneys act. Yeah, there's, there's really only three requirements for a matter to be called collaborative. And we tend to forget the requirements because as soon as they're satisfied, we put them over here. They're, they're out of sight, out of mind, although they're operating in the back of our heads the whole time. So the requirement is two lawyers, one for each um, uh, spouse uh, or father, mother, or you know whatever, one for each uh, client, if you will. Um, the two lawyers sign what is called uh, a participation agreement. It's the written agreement. It has to be an agreement in writing and they have to sign it. So that's the three requirements, two lawyers, 
both signing a written agreement. Now that that's out of the way, let's talk about what collaboration truly is. Great. And Wendy, do you have anything to add to that? Oh, I could talk for the rest of the hour on, on what collaboration <laughs> is. I got drawn into it because for me, it, it, it starts solving the problems before they even start. When couples decide to separate, um, the, if they move into a litigious environment, they're going to be positioned, they're going to be angry and, and hostile towards one another. When they move into a collaborative environment, it is about collaborating. It is about finding solutions, developing options. The couple then is in charge of their outcome rather than the courts or attorneys. And yet they have attorney representation. They can have and often do have a financial professional come in to help them develop financial options. And in the traditional model, they have a mental health professional that can really help them bleed off some of the intense emotions of the process and give them guidance if they are parents and how to best separate and protect their children. Because divorce doesn't hurt kids, it's the conflict that hurts kids and collaboration really works to offset the conflict, diminish the conflict and come to resolution. That's wonderful. I totally agree. Becky, do you have anything else to add in terms of defining what the collaborative process is? Because the next question I'm going to ask is, why do we want to avoid court? And I'm, I'm going to have Joran answer that because she has all kinds of horror stories that she can share with us. But I wanted to just give you the opportunity to add to that definition of collaborative practice. Sure, absolutely. Uh, for me, the collaborative uh, approach is a team approach, and each team member brings very specific skills to the table to help these people move forward after the process and in a way that's not only going to benefit them, but also benefit the children, as Wendy indicated. So it's a very valuable uh, uh, way to decouple. Great. Well, let me Great. add before before you jump in, Holly. Um, I think Dr. Wendy and Becky have both identified what truly makes the collaboration collaborative. Because, you know, I did my first collaborative divorce in 2002. I did two of them, and they went fine. They were just like mediation, no big deal. But they weren't interdisciplinary, and so this is how we really think of. Um, the collaborative process is being different because there's the, the um, facilitator, the specialist in communication between the parties, the, the mental health professional, which is Dr. Wendy. And then there's also the financial person who's the whiz at numbers. Lawyers can do the numbers. Many of them aren't very good at it. Many of them don't like it, but we can do those numbers. But why should we, if we've got a specialist who can work with the numbers and help our clients understand the numbers if our clients don't understand the numbers. And so those two neutral professionals come into this process and supplement what the lawyers do so effectively. We, many lawyers are not good at communicating because we use words. Our clients might need visuals. The mental health person is there to help those two people talk to each other again. I had a divorce with interdisciplinary uh, professionals where the wife who had complained to me early on in tears, in fact, that her husband never listened to her at the end of the three month process, she came out of that and her debrief to me was, I learned to listen to my husband again. And I had to remind her that she was the one at the beginning whose big thing was he never listens to me. But she said to me, well, you know, it's funny. It just sounds different when someone else says the same thing he just said, which is, yeah. you know, the Dr. Wendy in the room who's, 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 you know, communicating better. She can hear better when it comes from someone else, right? Yeah. Um, and then, right. Uh, you know, the same thing is true with what the, the Beckys of the world bring into the process, those numbers helping them work. But her husband, <laughs> this gal I'm talking about, when he got debriefed, he told his lawyer, I came out of my divorce a better person. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, mm -hmm. I came out of my divorce a better person. And Jordan, I'd like to add uh, one thing to your comment. And I think the, the, the biggest factor that you just mentioned is neutrality. I can say something as a financial neutral that sounds completely different coming yes. out of my mouth than it That's would exactly coming right. out of either attorney. So that, 
that's exactly right. She yeah. she's so so right. That's and I want to add with regard to the financial neutral. I was shocked when I first got trained in, in divorce matters from the legal perspective uh, and met as my first certified divorce financial analyst at how many options could be presented and how brilliantly they can predict what happens if you sell the marital home, what happens if you keep it, what happens if you sell this, if you keep that. Yeah. It's like magic to me that they can say, this is where you'll be 20 years from now and give several ways you can get to 20 years from now it's incredible, and I have not witnessed that in the traditional adversarial divorce where each person has their own financial person. They lock into, this is the only solution in collaboration. Well, and, and you, just, you just said it, they lock in, and in collaboration, we don't, we don't allow them to lock in. We just keep throwing options out there. And the more professionals there are interacting, the more we come up with these magical solutions. And I think Dr. Wendy put her finger on it. It's magic. That's what happened to me. In 2009, I did an interdisciplinary case where I saw the magic. And from that moment forward, I was just transfixed. All right. So that brings me to my next thing that I really wanted to bring up, because I think a lot of couples, when they get into divorce, they just think trial. And I, and I know that to be true just from people that I've known. They just think each get their own attorney and then they fight. And Joran, I know, and, and Wendy, I'm sure you've seen this too. And Becky, I've, I know you've seen this too. But I'd like you to just give an example of why would a couple not want to go to court? And what's the, what's the repercussions on both sides for, you know, even if somebody wins, they lose when they go to court and they're not the ones that are in control. So if you can just give an example of that, I would appreciate that. <laughs> oh, I can give, <laughs> as you might well imagine, I'm sure that all three of us probably can come up with examples. But I had a case, they were in litigation for five years. Um, the husband filed appeal after appeal four appeals. He was not really paying very much for his lawyer because his dad was running the show. His dad was a lawyer, uh, not a family lawyer. So it wasn't very good lawyering over there. He went through 11 lawyers over Ooh. there because as I found out later, when I asked for my attorney's fees and I put some of those lawyers on the stand to testify, dad had been calling the shots and the lawyers each eventually got tired of dad telling them what to do when they knew that that wasn't the best thing for their client. Um, and so they were in litigation for five years. My um, mom uh, totally ran out of money. She sold her pre-marital condo to pay me at one point. We won every single one of the appeals. I mean, it was crazy. He appealed the, the award of, of what used to be known as custody. He had been given every weekend, uh, but one a month because mom was a stewardess. And she said, when they lived so far away from each other, she said, fine, he can have all the weekends and I'll, um, I'll work weekends. So he got all the weekends. He appealed that. The appellate court approved it. And then he gave back two of the weekends a month. So he ended up with two weekends a month. Um, it, it, it just, he wanted 50-50, I think. But this was back in the day when 50-50 wasn't normal. And they lived 48 miles away from each other. So how could they go one week on, one week off, or even less than that, where someone would have to drive how far to take the kid to school every morning. It was, uh, it was yeah, just no, not, brutal. not that's reasonable. Brutal. Yeah, and the but, so you see, so you see the money that is spent. Right. And by the way, this isn't even an example of who's the judge, who is your judge. We talk when we do litigation and I know the ladies know this, when we do litigation, we talk about what's your judge's background. Does he have divorced parents? Has he been divorced? Is it a he, is it a she? Um, what color is he? What is the culture he's coming out of? Is he going to connect with you? Is he going to understand where you're coming from? Is he going to share your values? He doesn't know you. He doesn't know your kids. He doesn't know your spouse. Um, so you have this person who only knows the law. And by the way, every family's unique. So does your family fit in a, uh, a square box? because that's what the legislation is. The legislation is a box. What if your family is, is, is round? What if your family is oval? What if, you know, every family's unique. When we collaborate, 
We find their solution. We don't find this solution and squeeze them into that solution. We find our family's solution. No, I love that. I think that's brilliant. So I, that brings me over to, to Becky because Becky, I really wanted to find out. So you, Jordan, that was a great example of the difference. That was years that those that family had to go through of just fighting. So the emotional stress and the the income that was probably lost just because they were emotionally involved in that. Well, and my gal filed bankruptcy, which is yeah. not unusual. It's not right. unusual. Right, and that's that's the result of a of a contested divorce. Now, Becky, you have just the most amazing story I think I've ever heard about the complete opposite and what can happen in a collaborative process divorce. So why don't you share that with us? Sure. Um, Well, for me, uh, at the time of my divorce and now, it's all about the children. Uh, I could never have envisioned my life without total access to my children anytime and any day they needed me. And so my husband and I, adopted what's called nesting and we were lucky enough to purchase a condo in our marital in our residential development and every Saturday at noon he and I would change our residences the children stayed in the marital residence a hundred percent of the time and because my ex-husband and I maintained a very great relationship to this day we still work together um I could come in anytime to read my children a bedtime story, anything that they had been used to. And what's more, I never stopped being the mom. It was my job to pack the lunches, get them on the school bus. Every morning, regardless of where I was living, that would be my job still. And the only downside, I mean, I got to experience what most children experience, the shuttle back and forth. I was never where my shoes were. But uh, that to me was kind of a reverse role that gave me a lot of insight into what children usually go through. And we did that for four years. And it was uh, in addition to that residential dynamic, we also developed a, a different financial solution. And again, we created the outcome. It was us who was determining it, not two attorneys and a judge behind closed doors. It was my ex-husband and I, we had no support. And every month we would tally up our expenses for the children, for the different residences. Some months I owed him and some months he owed me. And we kept total peace between us and the children had the least upheaval imaginable. It worked really well for us. That's but, that's a unique solution. That's it a is perfect unique. example of a, yeah. Yeah, something that's totally the opposite. The yeah. security that the children feel when the parents are coordinating care for them is priceless because that's what it's about. If the parents can stay together as a co-parenting team, the kids are gonna continue to feel stable and secure, and they're going to be able to have a normal life, regardless of whether mom and dad are still married and living together. It's when there's conflict, whether they're still married, living in the same home or they're in separate residence, it's the conflict that that creates such an instability. I have a couple of children, nine years post dissolution, and they both have anxiety disorders. One's now being cared for by an aunt, um, not my children, but the case that I'm working with. Um, and the other child is on several different medications for tick disorders and anxiety and and that's one of the worst case outcomes of what happens when parents stay in the, that positioned adversarial role with one another. And the nesting process is incredible if, if parents can get there. Um, not too many can, but you can. Not too many can. You can get pretty close. Well, and you know, and, and then there's the, all, the other side of the, um, the universe where when I was seven years old, my parents divorced my mother loaded us kids in the van and moved me 3,000 3, miles away. And I never saw my dad again. And that is not an unusual story. It doesn't happen nearly so often now because the law prohibits parents from, who are divorced from moving away unless they get court permission or the spouse's permission. But back then, and it, and it happened regularly. Now it happens infrequently, but 
um, you know, where you're denied access to a parent for years and years and years. I never saw my father again. And we read those stories all the time, horrifying. Yeah, no, I, I, I've been reading your book, Storin, and so I've just read the most horrible stories about what happens with families. So that kind of brings me to my next question for really for all of you. Um, we can start with you, Wendy. What is the biggest issue, like when you're dealing with a family that's divorcing, what is the biggest problem that you run into? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, well, like in the family. collaborative process, like if you were, and, and this kind of gets into my, I have sort of two questions here. Like what advice would you give to families? Like, so they're going through the divorce process. What what would be the things, the, the issues that you deal with, the biggest issues and the advice that you would give divorcing couples? I think the biggest issue is the parents are looking at their best interest and not the children's best interest. And that's where a mental health facilitator has a, a, an advantage because I can speak to children's best interest. I can speak to developmental needs of children. Um, you know, and a lot of times people get so locked into how they're going to work it out for themselves, their schedules, um, and, and, and they're emotionally invested. As a neutral facilitator, I'm not emotionally invested. I'm looking at problem solving, but I'm also looking at it within the context of best interest for the two-year-old, best interest for the 14-year-old, best interest for the 10-year-old. And those can be different best interests. And again, with world creativity, it is a very creative process in collaboration to think outside the box and not stay in that box and, and find what's best for this individual family. And you cannot do that unless we're all sitting around a table, throwing out ideas, talking to one another and listening to one another. It's not even, by the way, Dr. Wendy, that's not even considering the fact that when the family stays amiable and can talk, then when the best interests of the children morph as they do over time, yes, they can then change. the parents can talk about how to deal with that as they go along, as they grow those children into adults which the law doesn't let them do. Once you get divorced and you're exchanging children every two days, they can't, the judge is not allowed to say, and by the way, when those children are a little older, let's move it to changing once every week. Um, the parents, on the other hand, can always do whatever the two of them agree to do is in their kids' best, best interest. And it's important to start that out as a template when they first come apart. Um, because if you, if you do that, then they have that sense of we are empowered, we're the parents, it's not the court, we're the parents, we can choose to change our parenting plan if we want. But if they've gone through the litigation process and the judges said, this is what it will be, there's that sense of permanence and there's a lot of hoops to jump through to get it changed. But if you start knowing you created this and you have the power to shift it and change it, sometimes with a stipulated agreement to be filed with the court, but oftentimes not, just go do it. You have that flexibility to adjust with your family because it's an organic process raising children. Any of us who've done it knows that. We cannot anticipate. <laughs> For sure. Now, Becky, I've talked to you a lot about the financial aspect and divorce, and I know you have specific software that you use to help your clients make projections. And I found that really fascinating. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Like what, what do you run into financially with couples that come to you and how do you use your software and your expertise to help them navigate those issues? Sure, well, uh, one of the things that I find is an overwhelming financial uncertainty. How can I possibly, how can our family go from one household where we barely have enough money to get by into two households and two separate sets of expenses. So what I do with my clients is I help them create a, a lifestyle expense projection. And then I, I match that up against whatever assets, whatever income there is to go around. And my software enables me to spell it out for not only the, the couple themselves, but for the entire team so that we're all on the same page with what this couple is going to be facing financially. And I would also say that one very important aspect is for the couple to understand their relationship with money. This is uh, easily accomplished, I believe, in some studying about financial uh, money personalities. Um, so I, I think that's, 
I think it's essential that they understand their biggest challenge is themselves. What are the money personalities? I'm, I'm curious to, to sure. hear about that. Sure. Um, yeah, I, uh, if you Google a money personalities, you come up with several resources. I, I use a book by uh, the Palmers and uh, the five money personalities, Bender, we all know what that is, Saver on the office, opposite end of the spectrum, a security seeker, a risk taker, and a flyer. A flyer could care less about money, not on their radar at all. So to understand where you're coming from uh, is, is very essential. I believe in my own personal life, if I would have known about this, I may have uh, avoided divorce, but. I was going to say, that seems like a big cause for divorce. You have two different, mm -hmm. very different money personalities. And then and let's not forget opposites attract. Right. I mean, a horrifying thing to recognize, but you rarely have savers marrying each other. You rarely have spenders right. marrying each other. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that kind of brings me to my next thing, because Jordan, you've actually shared some stories with me about how people have come into your office and started the collaborative process and then never called you back because they ended because up Because I've referred learning. them out to uh, an appropriate counselor. Yeah, I, um, I personally, uh, although I have been divorced, I rarely think divorce is your best option, um, especially if you've invested in the marriage. But so often we see that uh, what's causing the divorce is finance issues, um, but it may be actually a traumatic life event that gives rise to the finance that, that the, an issue that then causes the divorce. So, so if you're an older uh, parent and your kid boomeranged home during COVID, um, that may have caused your divorce. We actually have those people coming into our office. Uh, if you're an older parent with older parents, then you may be uh, that, that, that mom who has her dad moving into the house and her husband is like, wait, what? I didn't marry your dad, I married you. And what are we doing here? How are we gonna? So we actually do some collaboration in my office that is not divorce oriented. It's life planning oriented. So, so Junior is gonna pay for what bills while he's living with you. And he's gonna sign that agreement that we write up or if, dad is moving in with you, then who's going to pay for the nurse practitioner? Who's going to change his bedpans? Oh, and, and dad is going to have to sign that agreement too. So we, we are trying to address those traumatic life events that give rise to financial stress that gives rise to divorce. And we're trying to eliminate it way back here, kind of like Dr. Wendy uh, said earlier you know, let's start really at the beginning and work your way through. So I've had people come to me and I've said, have you talked to a counselor yet? And they've said, no, I didn't think he would do that. And I, I've said, let me talk to him because I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not giving legal advice now. Now I'm just talking about background and, you know, how to deal with trauma. Um, and so right. those pe people have gone to counselors and uh, not gotten divorced. Right. No, and, I, and that's such a wonderful story. And I think that's the power of the collaborative process is that you can actually help couples decouple and restructure their families without destroying them. But then, and then you can get stories like that, where people actually learn the skills they need to, so that they don't have to do that. Now, I want to address one uh, question that just came in from one of our viewers, which was, why do we have all women? And it's it's only because I was the one that invited these women and I've worked with all of them. And so I know them. She there doesn't are know any of, men. She doesn't I, know any men. I know some men. I know some men and I know they're wonderful. There are wonderful male collaborative professionals out there. Absolutely fabulous. But I just happen to know these women better than I know those men. <laughs> so. I do want to say, and I would love to hear what Dr. Wendy and Becky say, say about this, it, especially, you know, Wendy is sort of in my area. She's south of me, but Becky's way over here. Um, I will tell you that I think that the population of collaborative professionals is more women than men. I don't think it's 50-50. What do you ladies say? Well, for mental health people, it's entire, almost entirely female, but that's true of my field in general that we're heavily weighted uh, on the female side. 
Oh, I, I could get real sexist on that, but I'll leave it there. <laughs> I think in Cleveland, we have a very nice mix of male and female. So I, I think that we're uh, a little bit different than uh, you guys uh, up here in, in, the, in the frigid north. <laughs> right, right. I wonder if that has anything to do with it. It could be. Yeah. It could be. <laughs> So, so you are all three in very different professions, and I just want to know, like, where, what is the first point of contact, generally speaking, if somebody's going to get involved with collaborative divorce, is it with the financial or the attorney or the mental health professional? How does that, how does that first point of contact work? And anybody can answer. I, I, I don't really have that. <laughs> so I think, I think the theory is that usually it's the lawyer, because usually someone's decided that they have to talk about divorce. Now, keep in mind, Quite often I'm seeing someone and I'll send them to a discernment counselor because they think they want a divorce, but when I drill down, they don't really know. Um, they're just sort of considering what might happen if they were divorced. But we have counselors out there who are trained in helping them figure that out and may in fact have both uh, clients, both parties to the divorce come into the room to, to talk about that. Um, so, so, you know, maybe not divorce. Um, Dr. Wendy, what do you think about that? As to who's the first point of contact? Right. I, I think oftentimes I plant the seed, but I'm seldom the referral source uh, because people come in for marriage counseling and whenever there's a potential, I tell them about collaborative. I have collaborative brochures in my waiting area, just in case they don't want to talk about that. I don't have any other, you know, significant brochures out there, but I do have the collaborative uh, brochures and I have books on collaborative divorce uh, that I will hand out if people are specifically suggesting divorce. Now that's true in our area. I, I do remember having a training um, with a woman from Pennsylvania who was a mental health professional and she generated a lot of referrals uh, for collaborative divorce. Uh, I don't find that, that I generate that many directly, but I think indirectly, you know, two years after they've come to me, when they do finally decide that's it, hopefully they, they retain that knowledge and they seek out a collaborative professional. At least they know the information. How about you, Becky? Well, I think from my perspective, I'm typically brought into a collaborative process as a collaborative neutral from the attorneys who have begun the process. But one of my biggest referral sources is marriage counselor um, who may, uh, you know, want to transition the couple from, uh, you know, if they're not being successful in their counseling. However, I must say that recently as a mediator myself, I have begun to bring the team in to the mediation hmm. process. So that is another way to spread the advantages of having a team. I won't do it unless the team, the team members are collaboratively trained and there's a lot of trust among the professionals, but it, it's a way to, if people are scared away, I guess, by the cost and the uh, time commitment of getting all those professionals together, it's a way to, to bring the advantages of the team to the table for them. Can I speak to that for a minute? Yeah. Uh, because I've been privileged over the last couple of years to be involved in a lot of mediation processes, even with uh, situations which are not specifically collaborative uh, uh, di dissolution processes. They don't have a participation agreement, um, but but people are starting to recognize it, that importance. And so I will often be brought in for a couple of hours or a half day to the mediation process. So when there is bartering or, or difficulty, they're trying to find a solution with regard to the children and parenting plan, time sharing schedules, et cetera. They have an expert there that can inform them and without exception when I've been able to participate, I think uh, it's been a, a great advantage to bringing them to resolution on establishing a parenting plan because they're not operating in the dark. They have the expertise that I can offer them to come to a solution that again, best interests of the children. So this is how yeah. we see the, the courtless processes kind of morphing 
where it starts as mediation, but it begins to look like collaboration when we bring in the right neutrals to help us brainstorm all those potential solutions for that family, the unique solutions that they really should be thinking about rather than trying to fit their, uh, their round family into a square hole. Yeah, and that brings me to my next question. I think Wendy or Becky, I'm not sure which one of you brought up, but the cost of divorce. So uh, a person who's not um, educated on the process of collaborative may hear us talking about this and think, wow, that's going to be like a half a million dollars with all of these professionals involved. And so I would like to just address what is the real cost and how does it compare with the, with the traditional divorce? Jordan, I think you could probably talk to that pretty well. I, I can, yeah, I can answer that. Um, and and uh, maybe Wendy and Becky can add to what I say. But, um, you know, if you look at the various processes, and I actually have a poster in my office that I designed mm -hmm. that, that lists the courtless divorce processes. And I always tell the potential clients, look, these seven processes aren't all that are out there because of course, we could do a mediation where the Dr. Wendy is brought in and that's not quite the same as just straight mediation. So all of these can be made unique by the family itself, but this is what the various processes look like. And then I have another poster where I've actually gone through um, a series of cases and I've figured out what the average cost is with the average professionals uh, in the average uh, uh, Tampa, family. So, so you can't tell someone that these are the numbers, this is what you're going to pay, but this is the average cost, right? So a mediation, for example, without lawyers will run you between two and $5,000. A mediation with lawyers will run you between five and $10,000. A collaboration will run the usual family if there are children and if there's real estate to deal with around $30,000. That's expensive, that's the family cost. No question is expensive, but if you litigate, the average cost through trial will be 100,000 per person. So 100,000 for the one spouse and 100,000 for the other spouse. When I said 32,000, that was for the whole family. So, because it, we don't break it out, we don't break out, well, how much was the cost of half of the facilitator? What about half of the financial neutral? And, and then the lawyer and the lawyer. No, we look at the, the big picture. It was, it was about $30,000. In litigation, it's gonna be about $200,000. And by the way, that's not including the experts because I don't know if you're gonna have experts or not. You might, you might not. Right. I think it's really important for people to understand that all of these professionals that are involved in the collaborative process, they're doing so because they're doing the right thing. Like there, there was actually a movie that came out uh, five years ago, all about the divorce industry. And it was like Divorce Inc. And, and it talks about what a mammoth industry this is. And so when you look at the advantage financially for an attorney that does traditional trial divorce versus collaborative, there's, you know, there's more money, honestly, to be had, but it's at quite a cost. But I think, and I just want to, but in terms and of that takes, it, that takes us back to the participation agreement. That's why if we sign that participation agreement, the lawyer signs it and they agree they're not going to court, it takes that option off the table. Now the clients can always decide to go to court. Don't get me wrong. It's, it's their choice. It's their unique divorce. They can do what they want, but the lawyers sign on that they will not go to court. That option is off the table for them. And so they are going to work with all their heart and soul on getting this part, these, these clients to their unique solution. And that's always operating in the background. We forget about it after we sign it. It's done. Right. And what, what, what do you find is the difference for yourself, Joran, um, in terms of like just your own mental, your own mental health, being a collaborative attorney versus the traditional family law trial attorney prior to well, you know, I, I, I'm one of those lawyers. I love to win. I love to win. So I would, you know, be very careful about the clients I took. If they, if they have mental health issues, I probably wouldn't take them because they were going to lose. Um, uh, they were going to see the loss as a loss and they would blow it out of proportion. I would be afraid of those people. Um, but I, I tended to win my cases. I called my clients very carefully. Um, 
in collaboration, they always win. There's no one, there's no real losing in collaboration. Whereas in divorce, both sides always lose. No judge will ever, well, except in, in the case where my client kept winning. And then even one after the husband gave her back the, the weekends. Um, but it's rare that you have a, a, a black and white win-lose situation. Um, and mostly it's lose because you spend so much money. That client, by the way, her court costs and legal fees were over $300,000. I mean, crazy that her husband, who was not paying his dad for representation, so he just drove her into the ground. Um, and that's very, that's not unusual. Right. I want to just mention that we are dropping into the chat box all of your websites so that people can reach out to you directly. And there are also links to the poster that Joran mentioned about the average cost of a divorce. So that can be dropped in there. And if you go to Joran's Open Palm Law YouTube page, you'll see some pretty terrific posters about just the collaborative process and communicating. And I will tell you, I, I actually referred one of my friends to the poster about using your words wisely because my friend was going into an estate discussion with attorneys over the, the estate of her mother who had just died, who had quite a bit of property. And she used Joran's poster. She actually watched it several times. She, had, she actually emailed me and said, can you please send it to me again? I'm going in again. I just want to watch that. I want to watch that video Joran did again about this. So I sent her the link again. And, and even just that, using the right words, helped her. And she told me that. So I just want to make that clear that that's also another resource that people can use to help them in whatever sort of uh, situation that they have. There's also- well, and quite, quite interesting because I will give- a client, a handout poster, a, a consult to take back to his or her spouse. Um, because the posters, again, half of us are visual, half of us are, are verbal. And so it may be that she needs those, those handheld posters to explain what I had said because he didn't come to the consult and now she wants to sit with him and talk about which process might work best for them and what they can afford to do and what they want to afford to do. So, so it's helpful to even start the clients talking to each other about divorce. That's the one decision that's critical in any divorce. What process are you gonna use? Are you gonna litigate? Uh, if you decide you're gonna litigate, that's, I'm sorry, that's too bad. But, um, but you have these choices. When I got divorced, and this is what happened to me, when I got divorced years and years and years ago, there was no choice. I went to a lawyer and the lawyer said, fine, I'll file a petition. In retrospect, and, well, at, and at the time, actually, I was a lawyer. I didn't do divorce work. I looked at him and I said, wait, what? Why do I have to go to court to get divorced? I didn't have to go to court to get married. But nowadays, everybody knows you got to go to court. So they assume you got to go to court, but you don't. Right. It's, it's a choice. Right. Can I add something about, about the cost factors? The other aspect of collaborative is a project I've been working on that comes out of Canada of Streamline Protocol and there's low bono, flat fee. They have all kinds of names for it, but because the clients are so intricately involved in the process and take ownership, they can do a lot of the work. They can collect all the financial pieces for the financial neutral. They can work on the basics of the parenting plan on their own time. We have a plethora of materials that are available through the Streamline project that I've been involved in of the state of uh, Florida. There's one in New York, Canada developed it. Uh, other states have these same kind of materials available so that the parents can do the grunt work. They can do the heavy lifting and a team just comes in to tweak and finesse and that saves thousands of dollars. Um, you know, and, and it, again, it gives them ownership so that they're more engaged in the process. They're more willing to work on working it out. And I just love the streamline and that typically has a model of a flat fee um, that we assess going in. So we can say it's going to be $13,000, $5,000 and two meetings and you'll do this and you'll do that. Or it's going to be 21,000 because there's a lot of uh, property and, and business uh, assessments that have to be done or whatever. We can usually predict ahead of time with fair accuracy um if there's using a streamline uh process so we have those options as well within the collaborative process 
Wonderful. And Becky, I wanted to just bring up because I know you're using something similar up at uh, Facilitated Divorce Solutions and you have people because there are and we actually dropped into the chat box link, the link to the seven courtless divorce processes ebook from Joran Jenkins. So it actually goes through seven options, including collaborative that people can use to do a courtless divorce. Becky, what, what is one of the things that you're doing up at Facilitated with your clients and I think you're using kind of a similar program that Wendy is. Yeah, so I'm I've just recently been introduced to the concept of providing each client with a workbook which uh, is a, a particular uh, product that's put out by uh, an individual in uh, up uh, uh, gosh, I don't know where she's from but uh, her name is Jacinta Gallant and the workbook enables people to kind of get a get a better grip on where they're coming from how to communicate with the spouse so it cuts it 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 really allows them to focus on themselves and communication skills provides a summary of the law for people that's designed for the particular uh, state and it's been very helpful for the clients with whom I've used it so that's one way, and it's also suggested that you develop a fee, like because we're being told that people are getting very tired of uh, attorneys' uh, hourly rates, and so the, uh, a flat fee is the uh, recommended uh, uh, way to go in, in these types of processes. So it's it's a new tool that I'm getting familiar with and hope to use much more in my processes. Um, but I, I'd just like to say a little bit on the cost of the process. I've always related back to the old adage it, of it's a fool who knows the price of everything, but only a wise man who knows the value of the dollar spent. So it's, you know, from a cost benefit analysis approach, collaborative makes a ton of sense. Great. All right. So I see Wendy is here joining us. I am. Thank you, ladies. This was wow. actually incredibly fascinating. I got, uh, I was paying so much attention and, and I love the idea of all of this. And I think that it's wonderful that you're really spreading the word about this. And I think that if more people learned about it and understand how they can be amicable and with the children, it's it's so important. Uh, and people, I think, get caught up in the emotion of everything that's going on. And I think your approach is amazing. We did have a question in the um, that came in while you were speaking that said, um, what are your thoughts about the criticism of collaborative, that it's all or nothing? If there is one issue, then you have to start from scratch. How often is that an issue? I think that's Joran's question. Uh, I've never heard of all or nothing. I, I'm unfamiliar with the criticism, um, which is kind of odd because I've been doing this a long time. Um, if there's one issue, may, maybe I'm just not understanding the question. I so, think maybe that, okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I, I was just going to say, maybe if the person who asked the question maybe wanted to clarify it really quickly for us, we only have a few more minutes, but I, I might add that perhaps that uh, relates to the disqualification clause, meaning that in the event that the collaborative process is not successful, then the attorneys are out and you have to start over. And that's the motivation for not only the attorneys, but all the other professionals to make the process successful. So, well, and it's not, it's not exactly true. Um, they, the, the um, clients can agree on all of their parenting issues, but not agree on the house. Then they go get lawyers and they take it in front of a judge to decide on the house. Um, so I'm not sure, I, I mean, we can collaborate on any number of issues and get those issues resolved, but not all the issues have to be resolved in collaboration. We can parse them out. Again, it's unique. You can make it what you want. Once you go to litigate, then you're stuck litigating. And, and if you take only one issue to a, but if you take only one issue to a judge and you tell him, hey, we took care of all the rest of it, he'll respect that. Absolutely. No judge is going to go out there and make new issues for himself. He doesn't have to. He's got too many cases as it is. Yeah. John, how, how often does that actually happen? Like if you've got a couple that's interested in doing collaborative and they start, is that, 
yeah, I mean, I, my reality on it as I've been working with you over the past few years has been that they're generally pretty successful if people start the process. Oh yeah, I mean, ninety percent of the cases resolve, yeah. and and one of mine that didn't resolve, they reconciled. So there you go. <laughs> <They> stayed- <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. Well. Terrific. Thank you so much. That is our time for this session. So this was incredibly Uh interesting. I will say that uh, in the chat, somebody did chime in that many things can get resolved in the process. And if they get stuck in where in one area, they're not necessarily starting over, just like George. That was that was from David Smith, who is a uh, financial professional up in the panhandle. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. (laughs) So uh, ladies, thank you so very much for being here today and starting off the session for our World Creativity and Innovation Week, day two. Really appreciate it. Um, Christopher also said in the chat, thank you very much for the session. Um, You can reach Jordan or Dr. Wendy or Becky, obviously, uh, I put the information in the chat there. You can also reach them on the Whova app if you have any questions or need to message them. Um, But all of their information is there on their uh, on their websites as well, all their contact information. Well, we would also- Thank you. Oh, thank thank you. you. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much.